Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Improved Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Harmer, and today I am joined by Darren Meller, Brian McGuckin, and Nick Page. We were all together this week in Zion National Park shooting with a bunch of readers of Improved Photography from 15 different states and two countries who came out to spend a week with us shooting on one of our completely free photography workshops. We had an awesome time, and in today's episode, we just want to share with you the photography tips that we learned uh, this week. We want to keep it as practical as possible, things that actually made a difference for us uh, this week. Uh, so, uh, I mean, a lot of things happened this week. One, we broke a Guinness World Record. We got to shoot with everybody. I think all of us came home with some portfolio pieces. Uh, we want to talk about all of it. Uh, but Darren, tell me, maybe I'll throw it to you first. What's something that, that really stuck out to you, a lesson that you learned this week? Well, what stuck out to me is that you and Nick were right. I shouldn't be shooting F-22. And Nick w was out shooting Antelope Canyon with me, and I decided... I need to do some focus stacking. And I brought some images home, put them together in Photoshop, and was amazed at how easy it was and how much of a difference it made with my photos for having focus on the items that are in the foreground, midground, and background. So that never gets old to hear that I was right. It, yeah. it feels good every single time. Because <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. I know. Uh, you, have to, you have to appreciate it when it finally does happen. Yeah, that's right. So what kind of situations did you did you focus stack on, Darren? I focus stacked a lot in Antelope Canyon just because there was so much texture and you just really didn't want to miss out on it. And I felt like you were kind of cheating the scene if you had it blurry or in, in bokeh in the foreground, midground or background. So I just wanted to really exhibit the texture and how the water goes through and makes these nice leading lines throughout the canyon. And it was just a situation where I had to focus stack. Another fun one, though, was when I was laying on a road where it was 25 miles per hour and we were right near a parking lot and I wanted to focus on the asphalt, get the, the camera real down low and get a nice perspective and then have focus clear from the asphalt road all the way up to the mountains and then the sunset that was happening right behind us in Valley of Fire Canyon uh, or Valley of Fire near Las Vegas, Nevada. Did you focus stack when we were at Horseshoe Bend? So those of you who haven't been there, I'll set this scene. Horseshoe Bend is this uh, like perfectly circular turn in the Colorado River with this huge island uh, plateau that comes up like a mountain that comes right out of the mountain uh, off the uh, the island. And then you're up on the edge of a cliff on the outside of the river. And uh, I mean, you are on the edge of, of a cliff. And so I, I was out there. I think all of us were there that night. Uh, I mean, it, it's midnight. It's pitch black, hardly any moon out. And we're all like walking out to the edge of a cliff to shoot. Like, and you have to put your tripod like right on the edge of the cliff to get the shot. Uh, so <laughs> it was scary. I felt like I was going to die any minute. Uh, but it was a super cool location. Uh, did any of you focus stack there? Um, I didn't just because I really didn't, uh, include much of the foreground. Um, really, I, I was framing it a little bit, um, with the foreground, but it was so dim and so dark that the, the foreground really, it would have been just a black in focus blob instead of a black out of focus blob. <laughs> so, um, since I didn't do a daytime shoot there, I didn't really bother with focus stacking. Did you Darren? I, I did not. I was actually chasing you, you, Nick, and Brian, trying to get set up for our world record thing. So I ran up and down that path. I'm very, very familiar from the path to Horseshoe Bend and back to the parking lot, but I didn't have a chance to shoot it. Well, we're looking right now at, uh, I'm looking at Darren's photo, and it's, it's really, really good, uh, the photo of Horseshoe Bend. I, I, I guess the reason that I wanted to bring it up here is it's, you have to really think when you're focus stacking, not just like, you know, do I, you know, the technical stuff of, of getting a whole bunch of shots uh, and putting the focus at the bottom, then a little bit further back and back and back. Uh, but like at Horseshoe Bend, you would really only need two shots to do this. One of the very front foreground and then one of everything past infinity, because with a wide angle lens, infinity, where you're focused as, as far back as it can go, is like 30 meters often. Uh, I mean, it's really close to the lens uh, or closer. And so uh, a lot of times you don't need to take like 15 shots to focus stack. Sometimes it's, you know, two or three shots and that's really all it'll take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It kind of segues into one of the things that I was up against um, as most of the, the people that follow the Facebook group 
already know I destroyed a camera and a lens this this last week. And after and it was my 16 to 35, which is my most used um, uh, lens. And after that, I, I, has, I had a whole bunch of locations to go to, and I had to shoot um, Mesa Arch without my wide-angle lens. So uh, in that situation, I was having to do panoramas because I didn't have a wide-angle lens, and I was having to focus stack because anybody that's been there, you have this arch that's literally you know, a meter from you, and then you have to be focusing at infinity as well to get the, you know, the canyon in the background. So I was doing a panorama, and I was focus stacking, and it was a super high dynamic range situation, so I was bracketing as well. So I was, it was, it, it was a very big challenge to put all of that together, but I think I made it happen. But um, in that case, I was only focus stacking with two images, um, one focused on the arch, one focused on the background. So but, it was um, the focus stack that destroyed your Canon 6D and your 16 to 35. <laughs> No, it was because I destroyed my 16 to 35 <laughs> that you had to that, do that I had to do all of that. <laughs> like I shot more panoramas this past week after destroying my wide angle lens than I've ever shot in my entire life just because I'm so used to having that wide perspective and and wanting that like everywhere I go pretty much that uh, with my 28 to 70 like I it just that wasn't ever wide enough, so I ended up shooting so many panoramas this past week. Well, you know, I did as well because I was, um, you know, shooting with the Fuji X-T1, and I wanted the resolution that I'm used to when I shoot landscapes, 36 megapixels like I had on my D810. And so, uh, yeah, I, I did the exact same thing. I was, you know, with 16 megapixels, I'd shoot three shots, and then suddenly I didn't lose it resolution at all. I was just shooting panoramas everywhere. Anytime you can shoot a wide shot, you could really turn it into a panorama. The only difficult part is if there's a lot of motion between things. Mm -hmm. uh, but in landscapes, you know, that's not going to happen a whole lot. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I shot a ton of panoramas, too, and it was just fine for me to, to do that. And I really wanted the resolution so that it, if I got a photo that I wanted to print huge, which for me is pretty likely when I go on a big trip like this, chances are pretty good that I'm going to want to print one big. I wanted to make sure I had that resolution. You almost wish that you had like a D810 or something. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. Almost. But so tell us the story more. Like what actually happened? How did the camera fall off the cliff? Like <clears throat> were you hand holding it and it slipped out of your hand? Or did you set it down and you bumped it? What exactly happened? So I was in the process of putting it on my tripod. And I have an L bracket on my camera. And on this L bracket, it has these tiny little Allen screws that kind of attach to the bottom. Um, they're designed so your your uh, bracket can't slide out sideways right. in certain situations. Uh, but that was never a problem with my old ball head, my Enduro ball head. But with this new one that I, I've, I love so much, um, it's not as deep. So I have to be careful not to set the bracket in there where these little uh, nubby screws are otherwise it doesn't seat in all the way and what happened was I thought that I had it in there seated well I tightened it down I let go and my camera just fell off and began to roll down this giant like 100 oh. foot hill on hard sandstone and there was probably, I don't know, 75 photographers there. And it just happened in slow motion because like the first couple bounces, if I was quick enough, I could have grabbed it. But then it just slowly started picking up it. speed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm glad that I didn't try to get it because it would have been me at the bottom of the hill and probably in just as bad a shape. Um, but yeah, so all the photographers there, they, they were... I ran into several at my shoots later on in the week, and they're like, you're the guy that dropped your camera down there. And I <laughs> no, probably that was, ran that into was some other bearded man. <laughs> that wasn't yeah. Me. I probably ran into like 10, uh, 10 people that witnessed that. And it sucked because this lens was my baby. It was my favorite lens. And to like be on this really long uh, road trip of a lifetime without your favorite lens is like, one of the the most like debilitating terrible things ever i was 
I was really, really bummed out. But luckily, Brian, Brian saved the day and like he bought me, bought another one and then flew when he flew out, he brought it to me and then I paid him back. But it made for a much more expensive road trip on my part. That was it was a very expensive trip for Nick. Oh, one of my man. favorite parts about that story, though, Nick, was a guy went down for you to retrieve your camera. But tell everybody what he brought back up. Yeah, so he goes down there trying to to get my camera and to get my lens just on the off chance that anything's salvageable. And he brought up, like, pieces and parts of, like, five other lenses that weren't mine what? because oh. it happens so often that – like it made me feel a little bit better because obviously everybody drops their camera down there. It's just the thing to do. But the thing that sucked is the only thing I couldn't find was my SD card. So I lost photos oh. and that hurts. Luckily, like it wasn't any like super amazing, awesome shots that I was probably going to print or anything. But, you know, I'd went on some long hikes and anybody that knows Nick knows that I don't like long hikes. <laughs> so like that's probably what I'm the most upset about is I lost the proof, the evidence that I actually went hiking. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that is pretty tough. That that was uh, that was so sad when you posted that on Facebook. That was awful. But we put we put it on the Improved Photography p uh, Facebook page, and at least you got some sympathy from it. Uh, yeah. And I mean, to make up for it, we did have an awesome week because we broke the Guinness World Record for the most light orbs in a single photo. So you really just have to see a photo of this if you haven't, um, if you're not sure what a light orb is. You just have to check it out to see what uh, what it is first for it to even make any sense. Um, but basically, what it is is uh, it's a big ball of light, um, uh, a big ball of light that you make by uh, holding like a flashlight on the end of a string and swinging it in a circle. Uh, so we're just making like this, well, just big ball of light is the only way I can explain it. And you're capturing a long exposure at night so that you see the trails of that light making the big circle, right? And so uh, there's uh, the Guinness World Record currently uh, is 200, um, 200 light orbs. And it was set by, I think, the East Coast light, light painters or something. And what we did is we created, uh, well, we, we made 275, but only 235 were clearly visible in the photo. So we went out one night, and it was a crazy night. If you watched the video on YouTube, it was, uh, there was, there was, it was madness. It was just <laughs> madness. Um, but we we went out and we took the the um, we took the picture. So we made these light orb makers, and we spread out in this field. And Jeff Harmon got up on top of a cliff, and we just. Uh, made we just swirled these lights in a circle until we made 235 of them it was almost a 30 30 minute exposure um, and so we have busted the world record our info is submitted into guinness and uh, we should hear back but they're slow with it it'll be several months before we get an official decision uh, but uh, it, it was pretty awesome uh, it was a cool night and uh, you know light orbs are something i'm definitely going to be taking into uh, my night photography uh, I, I'm going to post on improved photography a tutorial on how to make your light orb maker uh, you can just swirl a flashlight but if you want to get into it more advanced we made uh, some like it kind of looks like a windmill out of PVC so you just spin uh, you know the the fans on the windmill as if it were uh, with the Christmas lights on it and that's what makes the the circle of light so it's kind of confusing without actually being able to see it but go check the YouTube video a uh, little bit frightening of a video we were we were having a good <laughs> Good time uh but uh but it was pretty interesting so go check it out on the improved photography youtube channel uh it was quite the night yeah the, the orbs are fun to make they're fun to just kind of like you know throw one of those into a night photo but doing that doing that many orbs in one shot like the logistics were just crazy like <laughs> We it didn't help that we changed locations like after it was getting dark enough to where we couldn't really see what we we're doing anymore, um, because in order to get that many orbs in the one shot, you you have to be able to see a large, you know, swath of land, and uh, it was just crazy. Like it was, it was a very interesting experience. 
They're not, not the, tr- they're not the straightest of rows, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> no. no, no, I was I was going straight, but Brian, like this was his first time orbing, <laughs> and he just really was not holding up his ends. Like I, I did was... well. I did well. <laughs> I think you did well, and I don't Crickets. think you've really orbed until you've you've done one on top of a cactus. I think there's one point when I got back to the hotel and I pulled out this long needle from a cactus out of my shoe, and I'm like. I'm really thankful that didn't go straight through my shoe and into my foot. <laughs> yeah, the vegetation was an issue because, like, you you would go and you'd walk your you'd walk your paces off, and then you'd realize, oh wait, I'm in the middle of a bush. I can't even do one here. And then you'd have to panic and find another spot. And then oh, it was crazy. It was it was an interesting experience. That's for sure. Well, go check out the YouTube video on that one. It was definitely fun uh, and cool. Uh, this is actually will be my second Guinness World Record. My first Guinness World re- re- Record was in tiddlywinking, and no, I'm not joking. That is serious. Uh, but this will <laughs> be number two. Um, but we got uh, some of the questions kind of over and over again because we had 60 readers of Improved Photography podcast listeners who were there. And uh, I, I at least heard a lot of the same questions over and over. So things we must be skipping over in the podcast. Uh, the question that I probably got the most often uh, was, is it time to update Lightroom? We've been talking a lot about the problems in Lightroom and the slowness. Um, and I've heard like a million different fixes and none of them seem to work for me until um, I switch to, uh, so you go into Lightroom, go into your preferences and then under your performance settings, you want to set your um, set your how much cash you have. Set it to seventy gigabytes. And when you do that, I don't know why it's this way, but Lightroom just suddenly starts to work, um, which is weird because it wasn't even quite a year ago that when you would have that uh, that number for your cache in Lightroom set over a gigabyte, which was the default, it would just slow Lightroom to a crashing halt. I don't know what it was, but it really slowed things down. And now they've made some changes in the back and you have to set it ridiculously high. I have no idea why this is, uh, but it has made a huge difference for me. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to go ahead and say it's safe to update. Uh, go, change your Change that number. Uh, we're going to want to change that to uh, to 70, but if you can do that, I'm actually using Lightroom pretty normally. Uh, the input's still kind of slow, uh, but everything else is is working pretty well. So for me, I would go ahead and say update. Have they changed the import dialog back to the way it's supposed to be yet? Not <laughs> or is yet. it still the new? It's still okay. the new one, which is just ugly. Uh, or if you use the move tool uh, on import, then that's something to be aware of. Uh, but uh, but it's just ugly. It's fine. Um, I, so I would still say uh, to to update. They did promise, however, that they are going to switch from the the Fisher Price one that they have <laughs> now back to the old one. So we should be seeing an update on that whenever they get around to it. Very cool. And thank goodness we have Jeff Harmon on the show. I mean, he has given us wonderful advice of when it's you know possible to update what the drawbacks are. And I kind of did a mix. I left my main machine that I call my workhorse machine, my desktop. I left that on Lightroom 6, the older version of it. And then I updated the new my laptop to the newer version of it. And then I listened to that advice in our private conversation we have between each other to up it to the 70 gigabytes. And literally, that is a night and day performance change. So I do recommend that people give that a shot. Yeah, I I experienced the same boost in performance as well. I was where I noticed it the most is um, well in two areas when I'm just scrolling through my photos, like doing my selections from a a shoot that I have a bunch of photos from um, the, the load time for each photo is just way faster, like dramatically faster. And the other place that I've actually noticed the improvement is on the spot removal tool. Random thing to see improvement on. But when, I, when I'm when i going through and just, you know, deleting zits, basically, or sensor dust, uh, it's just way faster, way snappier. And, yeah, those are the two places I've noticed the best, the, the biggest difference. Very cool. And one thing that I branched out on was we were around photographers from all different skill levels out there, and some of them dabble more in Photoshop. And this is probably the fifth time I've heard Jim's great comments or 
presentation, sorry, on composition. And he talked about how he flipped over one side of a rock in Iceland to another side just to complete the shape. And I did that with a different photo there. And no one really noticed when you we were going over our photo critiques that I took, instead of just using a magic lasso and taking out one of those power generator boxes that still is matching the color of Zion, um, I took a picture of a separate rock went ahead and pasted it in there. And the point of that is you need to figure out whether or not you can, if you're running out of things to do, try something new in Photoshop. And me moving rocks around, I'm not moving mountains like Jim Harmer is yet, but baby steps, baby steps. <laughs> That's right. Well, one question that I got a lot was if I regret just ditching Nikon and going over to Fuji. I did sell all of my Nikon gear. A couple people asked about that. Uh, it is gone. I'm only shooting Fuji right now. Uh, and I totally don't regret it. Uh, because a couple times I, somebody on the trip asked me to, you know, pick up their bag or something or hold their camera for a second. And every time it was like, Ugh, oh, yeah, I remember what that was like. Uh, and it is so nice to have a light camera. And like, like I mentioned earlier, when I wanted the resolution, I just shot a panorama. I know that doesn't work for all situations. It wouldn't work well if you needed to shoot super high resolution portraits, uh, which I do have a project coming up that I want to do that for. Uh, and that's a limitation. Uh, but for landscapes and stuff, I just shot a bunch of panoramas and it worked great. You know, and when, when I say panoramas, I don't mean that every photo has to be super wide. Uh, all I mean is I'm taking multiple pictures and zooming in uh, so that it gets higher resolution in the same aspect ratio. So, uh, Jim, I, one, sorry, yeah. one thing that you did mention when I, I was one of the people that asked you if you got rid of it all. And as soon as I asked you that, you said that you kept getting some error message or some problem that kept on happening with your Fuji? Yeah, I have been getting a bunch of error messages on the Fuji, and I was wondering what was going on. I was getting so frustrated with the camera, um, and then I realized, oh, the error messages only happen when I have a particular lens on. <laughs> and I bought that, that lens used on Amazon, and it was unusually cheap, and I thought I was getting a good deal. Mm -hmm. But I think somebody was selling it because it had problems, which wasn't very nice of them. If it was one of you guys, I do not forgive you. Um, so I'm going to have to send that one in uh, to to get serviced. But uh, I have finally isolated it. I think it was just that lens. You may not have a refund, Jim. Yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Another thing that I was asked about a lot um, is about bracketing. Uh, there was a lot of high dynamic range situations in Zion. Um, I, in fact, just about every photo I took was a high dynamic range situation because we were shooting in like these slot canyons. So these, I mean, you're in a, you know, a four or five meter uh, little trail and then beside you or on either side of you is just cliffs going up, you know, 15 meters, really, really high. So you're just in this tiny little slit of a canyon. So the wherever where you are, you know, the ground where you are uh, is a long exposure. Sometimes I was shooting exposures of like 55 seconds uh, to expose the, the creek that we were, we were walking through. Uh, but then you're looking up into the sun. And when you're looking up into the sun, well, the sun is bright up there. So it was extremely high dynamic range. And even when we were just, uh, you know, going around in other places, not just in the slot canyons, I mean, it was bright white fog and dark shadows on the mountain. It was, uh, it was, you know, the, the sun coming over a peak and, and the, the face of the mountain is dark and everything else is bright. It was just a lot of high, high dynamic range situations. And so uh, the question came up a lot of times if I was bracketing. Well, I haven't tone mapped in a long time. Uh, but uh, and, and in fact, it's rare that I even shoot uh, in a bracketed series anymore. Very rare. Uh, I, I'd say about two years ago, I kind of switched to just doing it with one raw file where I just, uh, you know, take the picture in the middle of the road, try to get the highlights and shadows as best as I can, but they're not, nine of them, neither of them are going to be great. And in Lightroom, I take the, shadow, the highlights down and the shadows up, uh, which I call making it do the splits because you're splitting the highlights and the shadows. And it just looks great. There's so much detail in a RAW file that uh, that's been a really good solution for me. Uh, sometimes on this trip where the dynamic range was just so huge, I did shoot some bracketed shots, and, uh, you know, it was okay. I, I just used Lightroom just to put them together. 
um, and, and didn't do a whole lot of like advanced tone mapping or anything. Uh, but sometimes it helped, but I really do feel like 90% of the time, if you shoot it right in the camera to get as much data as possible, and then you use Lightroom to do the splits, highlights down, shadows up, it's just as good. You get just the same dynamic range most of the time. Mm -hmm. Or I should say, you get enough dynamic range uh, that it's not worth going to the effort and the weirdness in your photo of using an HDR. Mm -hmm. Nick, do now you do the same thing? Are you shooting a lot of bracketed or are you, um, are you doing one shot and making it do the splits? I shoot a lot of bracketed and... I don't always use those bracketed shots. I mean, a lot of times I, I take them just so I know, hey, I got I got the exposure in there somewhere, <laughs> you know, and it, I can kind of work a little bit faster. But I do a lot of like luminosity masks in a lot of my landscape photography. Um, um, I, I use luminosity masks. To put so it let's all together. talk luminosity masks. Tell, tell right, me like I'm your grandma. This. Explain what it is. <clears throat> OK, so luminosity masks are a way of creating selections in Photoshop based on how bright the photo is. And the way that this is so useful is, say I have an image where my foreground looks really good, but my sky is blown out. Um, what I can do is I can create a luminosity mask that means that I can only um, affect the part of the photo that is a certain brightness, so like the sky. And then what I can do is I can um, layer my um, my darker exposure that has that nice sky in it. I can layer that over the top of my my brighter photo, select just the bright parts of the image, and then just paint in, literally just paint in my darker exposure, thus painting in that beautiful sky from the darker photo. And the, and the reason that, in my opinion, this is a it's a higher quality way of going is because I can expose the photo longer rather than boosting my shadows and I'll maintain the contrast in the shadows and it'll also be completely 100% noise free because I just exposed it longer um, rather than boosting it up after the fact because if you take a dark photo um, even if you shoot at ISO 100 and then you boost it up quite a bit you're bringing out a little bit of that sensor noise. And if you expose that, you take that same scene, you expose it longer, and and uh, you end up with much cleaner shadows. So luminosity masks are a very nerdy, geeky way of making um, like handmade HDRs, essentially. Now, here's a question for both you and Jim. I saw you both doing this at different times where you were shooting where there was some high high dynamic range. And Nick, you would like slide your fingers over the bright part or over the sun. And I know that had to do with sun flare. And Jim, I thought you said something about using your hat. Does that have to do with high dynamic range situ situations? Well, for me, like, um, so we're doing that slightly differently. Jim is doing, uh, using his hat kind of like a, a graduated filter. Um, I'm doing it because I'm, okay, so let's say I have a shot where the sun is right in the middle of my sky and it's going to create these lens flares across my scene. I want that sun star. The sun star part is cool, but all of those lens flares and stuff that happen um, because of it, I don't really like. So what I'll do is I'll take my one shot that has my sun star, the the sky as a whole, got, got the whole scene. And then I'll take another shot where I just put my thumb over the sun. And what that does is I will get a nice clean foreground with no um, lens flare of any kind. And I can use that frame to just, just kind of clean up the spots of my foreground where I want to get rid of all that lens flare. Okay, so you, so Nick is using his thumb to like you know, physically covering up, you know, putting his thumb in front of the lens over the sun, and he's basically using his thumb as a lens hood because he doesn't yeah. want that flare messing up the area around the sun because it's going to be bright not just where the sun is but all around it, you know. So he wants to have that clean. Uh, so that's – and then uh, – and he's keeping his thumb there, so it's just dark in that spot. So he has uh, the ability to, to change it later in Photoshop. Is that right? Yeah. And, exactly. and then the way that I'm doing it is I'll get the lens and I'll take my hat off or my cell phone or whatever. And just if it's, you know, a long exposure, it only works with a long exposure. I'll put my my hat. I always wear a gray or a black hat for this. 
Um, and, you know, I'll put my hat covering the top half of the picture. I'll press click to start the picture, and then I'll uh, be kind of moving my hat, kind of shaking it up and down, and I'll bring it uh, from halfway uh, up to make the, the, sh the lens fully exposed at the very end of the exposure. So the top of the picture where it was covered by my hat is only getting light for maybe two seconds, and the bottom half of the picture gets the full 10 seconds that I set the shutter speed to. I need something dark uh, to put in there, and it doesn't have to be perfectly black, just something dark. Um, put it in front of the lens, and then, uh, and then you got your shot. You can, you can get it all in one exposure. Uh, so they're both kind of different, uh, different techniques, but they really accomplish the same general purpose of just darkening part of the frame. Mm -hmm. And to that, I think it's, it's also good to point out something I learned on the trip in to this is that whatever you take with you, whether it's your camera bag, a pocket full of gear, it's your burden. Um, I, there was one point in time where my dad and I hiked down to the bottom of Bryce Canyon and we were huffing and puffing. We had two lenses in our camera bags, um, a laptop computer, believe it or not, and a bunch of other just crud in my bag that I didn't even use. And I realized I'm going to walk out with one lens. So with this, if you can figure out a creative way to put a hat up there to create um, a neutral density effect, the uh, graduated neutral density effect to your photo, I think that's a better way of doing things because it's going to make you more nimble and not make you regret the hike like Nick was talking about. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There was I, there was plenty of hikes that I was regretting. Like this entire this entire trip was just like one big re regretted hike. <laughs> my <laughs> my feet are still sore. But you it were is, glad you you were glad you did it. Exactly. Like the Canary Creek, you know, you didn't you're yeah. like, How long is it? A mile and a half? Oh and then you were there and you loved it, man. Yeah, I know. And that that was kind of another theme for me is like Every sunrise shoot, I was like, I was dragging my feet. I didn't want to go. I just wanted to, you know, lay in bed and then go get a Starbucks at about 8 a.m. Like I was, I was not super excited for all my sunrise shoots until I got there. So, and then I was like, oh, I'm so glad I came. And sometimes you just have to force yourself to, to get out of bed at, you know, the crazy hours that you have to hike in the water, even though you don't want to. And then you get there and you're always glad you did. There's, there's never been a time where I was like, I should have just stayed in bed because this, you know, this is just not, this is just not cool. So every single time I got up early, I was glad I did. I know I was the first person at Mesa Arch, which anybody that has shot there knows that that is kind of a feat in itself because it's such a popular spot at sunrise. But, um, I got to be the first one there. I got to pick my spot. Um, I got to, you know, set my tripod up wherever I wanted to. And I was glad that I did. Yeah, and that, that adhered to one of the rules of the workshop is you should only sleep on one of these events when it's absolutely necessary. If, if you're tired out there, even if you make a couple of mistakes on some shots, you're not going to regret it. If you're sleeping and you miss that sunrise or that sunset, I think you're going to be kicking yourself in the butt because you're not going to be coming home with as many high quality shots or that amount of quantity of shots that you could possibly transform into some quality. Yeah. So Brian and I, like we shot together for like two or three days before we actually met up with the rest of the group. And, uh, you know, I think I, Brian was kind of having quite a few aha moments. So maybe why don't you talk about some of the new stuff that happened with you, Brian? When I landed, I flew into Vegas, and then Nick and I were going to be meeting in Monument Valley. And along the way, I've never been to this area, so I've never been to the Grand Canyon. So um, so when I landed, it was late at night, so I drove a couple hours towards uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, spent the night, woke up to four inches of snow. And I'm like, I'm in the desert, and it's 70 degrees back in Indiana, and I'm in four inches of snow here. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Nick and I started contacting each other, and I said, I'll be there probably around this time. And uh, my plan was to head and go to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And I'm driving through snow, and I get gas when I'm about 10 miles away from the Grand Canyon. And I asked the lady, I'm like, is it going to be like this at the Grand Canyon? Because I'm thinking it's going to be hard to shoot in the snow and the clouds and everything. And she's like, oh, it's going to be worse when you get there. So I'm like, great. So I start <laughs> driving and I'm five miles away from the Grand Canyon and it was completely dry. There was no snow. The ground wasn't wet or anything. So I'm like, okay, this, there's, this is going to be good. I get to the Grand Canyon, get out, and I walk to take a look. 
and it's all clouds and I couldn't see anything. So I was so frustrated. I'm like, great, this is my first time here. I can't stay very long and the weather's horrible. And so I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just take off and keep driving. And I decided, no, I'm going to stick around for a little bit. You know, things change and I've never been to this area before. And sure enough, about 10 minutes later, the clouds started to open up and the sun was coming down, which created really cool shadows down in the textures and the layers of the Grand Canyon. So there were spots that were lit up and some spots where you could see that was a shadow of the clouds and it just, it was awesome. And so, um, I just learned, you know, you, you need to wait out the weather. And when I met up with Nick, that was another example of it. We got to Monument Valley and it was, uh, it was wet and it was rainy and I texted him. I'm like, Hey man, I'm here. I'm in the parking lot. He's like, I'll be right there. And it's storming and it, it was even hailing at one point. And, uh, we're standing there and it was like, this is sad. This is a bummer. And we just said, well, let's just wait and see what happens. And sure enough, it stopped. And there was there were still rain clouds up above. And the sun started to set. And it uh, just popped a little bit of color up there that we you typically don't see. Because normally you see a nice, clear blue sky, you know, with the monument out there. And so that was awesome. And then we stayed at a hotel that was about 30 minutes away. And the plan was to wake up and go back there again. And we woke up and there was snow again. And we're like, okay, well, what are we going to do? So we're like, well, let's go check it out. So we get there, and it was beautiful because you had the snow all over Monument Valley. But you could see, like, the red road and, and the red mud still. And it just was awesome. It was a totally different shot than what we had from the day before. And both of those shots are pretty much different than the typical shot you see of that. Mm -hmm. So I think just learning to just wait out the weather, you know, when you're doing landscape photography, being patient, you know, go inside and, and eat some breakfast or, you know, have a cup of coffee and, and then come back out. Because when you've got clouds and storms like this, you're getting different photos of the same location. And it's just, that was amazing. So that was probably the, the main thing that I learned. Yeah, it was, it was cool because we were there and we got, at least I got, uh, since I was sitting there tapping my toe waiting for Brian to show up because he was having his Grand Canyon uh, adventure. But um, I, it looks like I shot it in three different seasons. I mean, uh, when I first showed up, there was like low clouds kind of obscuring the monuments. And then, uh, and then later in the day, we got those, uh, the, the color where it looked like there was a thunderstorm happening back behind. And then the next day, there's snow. Um, when you were, we're shooting in these like high deserty kinds of places or mountains or anywhere like that, the weather often changes often and fast. So just being patient and, and hanging out and waiting for things to change if they're not perfect is always worth, worth your time. Well, you did some extracurricular shooting, not just landscapes, Brian. I, we've been seeing you on TV. Uh, yeah, well, that was after the trip. Yeah, I, it was I after the trip. Back, tell us about it. Well, I flew back home, slept for six hours, and then had to wake up because I had a shoot in the morning. And then uh, after the shoot, I got to go down and shoot the Colts versus the Broncos game. I've shot the Colts games a few times, and never, though, with uh, – Peyton Manning so I, that was one of my bucket list games to shoot and had the opportunity to go down there and do that and got some decent shots of Peyton Manning and it was it was packed it was totally different than the Lions game that I shot with Nick where there were a handful of photographers were here for the, this game it just was packed and it, because it was back in Indy uh, Manning waited to come out he didn't come out on the field until right before introductions and as soon as the game ended, all the photographers rushed out. And mm -hmm. you know, usually there's just like one circle of photographers around the quarterbacks as they shake hands and all. There were at least five circles. There were at least 50 to 60 photographers all mm -hmm. like pushing. And the poor guy, poor guy behind me, he was he just he wiped out. <laughs> it was like a stampede. But it was it was a good game. I I'm learning to uh, continue to get better shots of the catch, which that's typically the hardest part to catch in a football game is a receiver jumping up and so I'm, I'm starting to spend more of my time when I shoot NFL games shooting from the end zone instead of along the 10 or 20 or 30 yard line on the sidelines it just it gives you a better opportunity to see what's going on so mm -hmm. and what what lens are you using what's your short lens uh this time I just I had my two camera bodies I used my 5D Mark III, and I rented a 400 
it lends. I can rent it for a hundred dollars for the weekend. I pick it up on Friday and have to return it on Monday. And then on my 70 Mark II, I had my 70 to 200 2.8. So those were the only two lenses I used during the game. And uh, at the very end, I had my 24 to 70 that I put on just as everyone goes out to get the quarterbacks shaking hands. Huh. Very cool. And and what was your shutter speed for most of the game? Um, good question. Probably around 400th, one 400th of a second. Whoa, that's slow. And that yeah, worked though, huh? Yeah, yeah, it was working. And a lot, a lot of times, um, some of the stadiums, like in the past, whenever I shot in Minnesota, I always had to shoot at like a 1600 ISO for some reason. Uh, this time I was shooting closer to a thousand, which, uh, it just was interesting to see the difference in that just from the lighting that comes in at Lucas Oil Stadium compared to the Vikings. Wow, very cool. Very cool. Well, it, it, you got some great pictures from it, so congratulations there. And, uh, yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. Well, uh, we learned a ton of things on on the shoot, but uh, one that as, as we all kind of wrote down our, our tips and things that we learned in the last week, I think every one of us wrote down uh, something about waiting for the right moment for landscapes. Uh, and it's definitely something that I noticed as well uh, as we would, you know, so we'd go shoot in the morning, you know, we'd meet, we'd meet up for breakfast and then we'd say, you know, who wants to go where? And we'd usually break into about three groups of, you know, one person wanted to go shoot bighorn sheep, wanted to go to some overlook and another to a slot Canyon, you know, uh, and we'd all break up into groups of 15 or 20 and go shoot for the morning. And then we'd come back in the middle of the day, have a presentation or two about a different technique in photography. And then in the evening, we'd go out, shoot again. And then at night, after the day was done, we would uh, all look through look through the photos that everybody got. And as I talk to people, uh, you know, whenever somebody said, oh, you know, I kind of I'm not sure if I got anything great. Uh, I, I just I hated uh, I hated it because sometimes I'd be out shooting with them and they would leave like 15 minutes too soon. Uh, and right after they left, you know, it was the moment and everything looked good or, uh, you know, I, I'm tired and, and they'd leave and then everybody would say, let's go do night photography here or there and, and we'd go shoot. And that was the picture of the day, you know. Uh, so, you know, landscape photography really is a lot about just your willingness to put forth the time. You know, you travel clear around the world, you get to an awesome location, you're ready to shoot, all excited. Uh, but I so often saw people kind of giving up a little bit too soon that you just got to be patient and wait for the shot. I am like the least patient person on the planet. Uh, I'm not patient with anything in my life. I'm trying to get better at it, but it's not a virtue I have yet. Uh, but I've shot enough landscapes to know that you really do just have to wait. And sometimes we got to locations two hours before it turned prime, uh, and you just got to kind of wait it out until the lighting mm -hmm. is just right if you want to get that excellent, epic photo uh, of, of a location. Otherwise, you get an awesome location with not-so-great lighting, and it's always going to be a meh kind of photo uh, because of that. So uh, I, that's, I think, one thing that, that stuck out to all of us. Yeah, it's crazy how often it happens where you're at a good spot and the, the sun just barely pokes over the horizon and all the photographers pick up and leave. And I'm like, no, don't we got to wait because the, those moments, you know, 10 minutes after the sunset, the actual sunset, that's when all the color happens. And and if you wait for those those that awesome light that happens and you've hiked in, it often means that you're walking back in the dark and. And um, it's just one of those things that you have to kind of sacrifice. Like you might be bumping over things and tripping and walking back in the scary dark in the middle of the in the middle of the desert, but at least you shot it in the best possible lighting situation. Now, um, when portfolios come through, I think the most common thing that I say to people is that uh, you know this is it's an awesome shot but you got to shoot it at a t different time of day. You know, if you shoot it during sunrise, sunset, uh, blue hour, something like that, something interesting and different, it just, it's amazing how much it helps the shot. Yeah, absolutely. Another, another thing I would say is just do the best you can with what you have. You know, we were, we were all on the bridge with like 60 other photographers <laughs> at, the, at that one spot, all waiting for this beautiful sunset. 
and there was none. It, there, it wasn't a beautiful sunset. But a lot, so a lot of people left, like Nick said, and I stuck around and I did the best I could with what we had. And I got a, that's one of my favorite shots. You know, there's not a lot of color in the sky, but after I, you know, played with it in Lightroom and all, I was, I was pleased with the shot. So just because you don't get necessarily what you envision in your mind doesn't mean you're not going to get an epic shot after it. Yeah. And yeah, you can always replace that sky anyway. Right. That's what sky I was going to say. I know a guy yeah. who has a tutorial yeah. on this. Just go to improvephotography.com yeah. slash sky replacement and you get Nick's tutorial on how to take a sky and put it in a different landscape or a, a, a portrait, anything. He walks through a bunch of different examples. Uh, and I use that a ton for this last trip. In fact, I use the actual product that Nick and I put together. Nick did all the video tutorial. Um, and then we both looked through our Lightroom libraries of a bunch of backgrounds we've just taken over the years. And so when you take a shot like this over the bridge that was a beautiful location, but there was just no sunset, you just go in there and you get one of Nick or my sunsets and you put it in your photo and it's totally yours. Those are totally yours. You can use it for commercial purposes, anything, whatever you feel like doing with them. Uh, and the whole thing is only 10 bucks. So go mm -hmm. to improvephotography.com slash sky replacement. Uh, that is well worth 10 bucks. It's something that I even use uh, a lot. Uh, but but the, the, the teaching on it is excellent as well. Yeah, well, it's we most only... excellent. It I wanted to say real quick, it's most excellent also because once you've used it once, you actually go out and you'll shoot and you'll say, okay, I have a great foreground here, and you actually can put it together with the sky replacement and make it believable. I did that with coral pink sand dunes when I wasn't sliding down the dunes like a little kid, but I used uh, the sky replacement in there, and it looks gorgeous, and otherwise I wouldn't have taken the shot if I wouldn't have had Nick's sky replacement in the back of my mind. Very cool. Well, we only have a second left, but we want to share our doodads of the week. Mine is the Cerevo Live Wedge. Um, this really only applies if you are a media professional uh, or, or a hobbyist, a tech enthusiast. Uh, but a lot of you are. Uh, and maybe that's why you're into photography is you're, in, is you're doing media. Uh, so I, we're working on getting all of our podcasts in, in uh, video as well as audio. It's going to take some time. I can't promise it right away. Uh, and I've tried things like the Blackmagic ATM and, and, and many others uh, trying to do this live switching. So you have a bunch of different video cameras. You have people on Skype. You want to show your desktop. And I don't want to record all those things and then spend like two hours every after every episode in Premiere editing a video together. I want to do it on the fly. Like how when you're watching the news, they just you know switch between cameras and stuff and, and you see it right then. Uh, so that's a live video switching. And this is a $1,000 device that takes four HDMI ins and you control it from an iPad. Uh, I've tried lots of much, much, much more expensive systems like this and they were just too complicated. And so far, I'm pretty happy with the with the Cerevo Live Wedge. Uh, that's C-E-R-E-V-O, Cerevo Live Wedge. It's a pretty cool device. Nick, what do you got for us? So <clears throat> I have neoprene socks. That's the most random nice. thing that you're ever going to hear, my dude, dad. But um, we, we went hiking up one of the slot canyons, and Jim was nice enough to let me use his hip waders. And it was awesome because they were nice and warm. They kept me dry, and we were walking in this frigidly cold water. Um, I don't know how you guys did it without hip waders because there's no way I could have toughed it cold. out. It was ridiculous. Like, no wonder we all have colds. But uh, but walking around in hip waders is not the easiest thing in the world to like go on a long hike in a set of hip waders. But uh, these these NRS neoprene boundary socks, they're designed for kayakers, but they're completely a waterproof sock that goes all the way up to your knee. And you could easily just toss these in your camera bag, keep your feet completely dry. If you had a set of like water shoes to put over the top of them, it would be perfect for this type of stuff. So if you're going to be sloshing around and stuff, uh, these would be a good, a good investment. I'm going to be hitting the buy button right after this podcast. Very cool. Brian, what do you have? Uh, for me, it, it was something where, you know, I saved Nick by bringing him a, a 16 to 35 lens. He <laughs> saved me. Well, he didn't save me, but he helped me by letting me use some of his uh, Zeiss wipes 
they're alcohol free pre moistened like lens cleaning wipes and I think he said he had like a box of four hundred. I see him here on uh, Amazon or something for like twenty three bucks for four hundred of them. And it was great just using one to be able to wipe off the front of the lenses and um, just have those clean and it was easy and just toss it when I was done and especially when you're shooting in places where there are like waterfalls and that water sprays up and if you don't catch it right away, um, it's just nice to be able to have one of those wipes to clean it off. So Zeiss wipes. And you're not using this for an imaging sensor, right? Correct. I just was using it on the front of my lenses. Okay, good. Every time somebody I hear somebody trying uh, to clean an imaging sensor and they use any liquid, it always ends in disaster. I, I know some people do it that way, but I, I'm just saying just get a peck pad, dry, wrap it around your finger, and wipe it on the sensor, and it fixes every problem I've ever had with uh, with a dirty sensor. Uh, so these look really cool for a lens. In fact, I think I'm going to pick some of these up uh, because the moisten, so it'll be nice to get off but b bigger smudges. But I probably wouldn't recommend this for cleaning an imaging sensor. Right. And Darren, what do you have? Well, we always, we've always we had some people write in saying that we have some really affordable doodads of the week. And I was fortunate enough that someone joined us on the trip, Jeff Peterson, who also joined us in China with a $9,000 lens. And we're talking about the Canon EF 500mm F4 L-glass um, USM uh, lens that ha has image stabilization in it. And it is a big piece of lens. It is about the size of a bazooka. But he also had it on a 1.4 um, teleconverter, the version 3. And I slapped my APS-C um, Canon 70D on there. And I got some really cool close shots of bighorn sheep because I was clear out at 1120 millimeters. So if you have about 10 grand laying around, uh, then you can get real close on some wildlife, even if they're not that far away from you physically. Well, very cool. Well, thanks for joining us in this episode of the Improved Photography Podcast. We enjoyed seeing many of you out in Utah and Arizona on our free workshop. If you want to join us in Yellowstone, we are going the first week of January. Go to improvephotography.com slash workshops. And also be looking out for the Lightroom Steel 2016. Uh, it is coming out very soon uh, on Black Friday. Every year I spend months and months and months and months and months uh, putting together a brand new collection of Lightroom presets and training. And in this one, I really went over the top in the video training portion. Uh, I hired a video crew and we did a really, really cool shoot uh, showing how to use flash photography. Um, and so I, you're definitely going to want to pick it up. It's the best product we produce. No question about it. Uh, it will be at improvephotography.com slash presets on Black Friday. Don't forget it because all the other stores, you get those ads for Black Friday, and they aren't even sales anymore. It's not even worth going out and shopping on Black Friday anymore, the end of November. Uh, but this is a sale that's a true real sale because of the rest of the year, uh, the bundle costs over 400 bucks. Uh, so you got to get it on Black Friday, $39.99. And thank you for joining us in this episode. We'll see you in another seven days.